Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Gathering Place. We're so grateful that you today, and those of you watching online, we're grateful for joining us. And um, it's just really beautiful here in the summertime, the summer evenings in Simi Valley. It's so nice. And this is just really a nice property. It's a nice place to kick back and just kind of enjoy yourself. So come visit and hang around, sit on the benches afterwards. Maybe not in the heat of the summer, but other times. All right. Uh, one of the things we like to do is prophesy to California. Amen. And actually, last, last Saturday, the anointing of the prophet came on me. Not, not a prophetic anointing. There's a difference. But the anointing of the prophet came on me. And I prophesied to the state of California. And I, actually, I felt the same kind of anointing that when Kim would prophesy. And it was powerful, and I know it's going to come to pass, so I'm excited about that. And of course, this is my prophetic symbolism. Amen. I wear something every... We would have a flag up here, but Randy pilfered it yesterday for some unknown reason. I think he wanted to put it up in his room or something. He's inspired by it. Because I watched you do it. <laughs> Anyways, um, I, I really believe that our speaking grace to California is having an effect, and there will be, a, there will be transformation that comes to our state. And um, Rodney seems to have an anointing to just know uh, what to speak grace to, and one of the things he spoke to, uh, I think it was Thursday night, Thursday, was yeah. to the weather. And then I don't remember when, I think it was toward the end of the meeting, just this anointing, again, a prophet's anointing came on me. I started to prophesy about the weather. I think it was in California. I have to look, go back and listen to it. Was it, Nathan? Is that right? Okay. So I, I think it was the weather in California that we have an unusual weather pattern and so on. But I'll have to look at the whole thing. Anyways, let me read this to you, and we're going to declare grace to our state again. <sighs> then the angel talked with me and answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. That was in the Old Testament. Yeah. And they, didn't, they weren't even baptized in the Holy Spirit. How much more for us? How, how do you think the angels and the Lord, they look down on us and they go, Quit being pathetic. No, I'm seriously, as Christians, like, Lord, help me today. Like, that's the extent of our faith. You know, these guys were declaring things to the nations. We're the sons of God. We have dominion. We have authority. But somehow, well, I better not get into it. Get ahead of myself. Who art thou, O great mountain, O great government? That's what mountains represent. Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. And he shall bring forth a headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. The grace of God is so powerful, and Christians forget to use it. It's like use, use the grace that God's given you. Speak grace into your life. Declare it every day. It's like Kat Kerr said, one of the visitations when Jesus appeared to her openly, true prophet, he appeared to her and said, I'm going to tell you why your life is a mess. Isn't that just like Jesus? He's so sweet. He's so sweet and kind. He holds a sheep in his arms. I just love him. Except when he talks mean to me, then I just, you know, I zone out. But he said, he goes, the reason your life's a mess, he goes, he goes I'm going to teach you something. He said, before you roll out of the bed in the morning, he goes, I want you to ask me for my grace. And did you notice that every single letter that Paul wrote, except for Hebrews, that every letter that he wrote, the first thing he did was say, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And even other writers, not, not in every letter, but called for grace. And he ended every letter with grace. It wasn't just some holy breath. You know, we think like American. We think like Western culture. You know, like, like, a, like a prayer in school. Father, bless us this day as we go. You know, like that kind of a thing. But when he was saying things like grace to you and peace, he was releasing something to them. 
Amen. And he ended it with releasing grace to them. Yes. Anyways, Rodney, take us home, brother. I'm glad you said that because I just wanted to encourage you. When we shout grace, we're releasing a frequency. And we're releasing a frequency that will bring freedom, it will bring justice, it will bring righteousness, it will bring peace, it will bring liberty. And so just know that as we shout grace. Now, the first five that we're going to shout today are things that we're shouting against. We're going to see that mountain come down. But then the last part is going to be things that we're going to see grace release that will bring the opposite of what we're coming against. Got it? Okay. All right. I shout grace against child mutilation. I shout grace against child mutilation. I shout grace against child trafficking. I shout grace against child trafficking. I shout grace against drug trafficking. I shout grace against drug trafficking. I shout grace against the cartels. I shout grace against the cartels. I shout grace against mind control. I shout grace against mind control. Now, I shout grace to our brains. I shout grace to our brains. I shout grace to freedom. I shout grace to freedom. I shout grace for justice. I shout grace for justice. I shout grace for righteousness. I shout grace for righteousness. I shout grace for peace. I shout grace for peace. I shout grace for liberty. I shout grace for liberty. And I shout grace for unity. I shout grace for unity. Now let's shout grace seven times. Grace, 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 grace. That's so good. Yeah, the, the child trafficking thing. Um, Amy sent me a thing yesterday where I guess the ice cream truck came by and, and the kids were getting ice cream and this guy grabs a six-year-old girl and he's walking off with her. And uh, these 13-year-old girls come up and say, hey, are you related to her? And the little girl said no. And he goes, yes. And they said no. She said no. Let her go. And these girls followed him and they, and they had the cameras out and he let her go. He was trying to kidnap her. So I thought, man, what courage for those 13-year-old girls. Righteousness is, because I, I, I thought about when I was growing up. Oh, my God. I, I was in kindergarten. I was walking home from school. It's like three or four blocks. I was a four, you know, I was four and a half years old. I, well, same in Ireland when I was four. I was out there playing, you know. Your parents are sitting in the house. We'd be out there playing with the street kids, four and a half, five years old. <laughs> you know, walking back and forth to school. The kids don't, they don't, and now they arrest the parents for letting them do that. No, it's really, it's gotten really bad. Anyways, let me get off of that. But the grace thing is really, really good. Make sure you do it every day. Don't forget it. Even if you go, I feel like a bum. I think God's mad at me. Just go, Father, give me grace. <laughs> Seriously, just do it. Don't go by what you feel. You know, go by what you believe. Because your, your own feelings can deceive you. So this passage in John, before we take the offering, I always like to read something. It said when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company, come unto him, he saith unto Philip, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? <laughs> and this is what I love about Jesus. He's such a punk. Like he really is, he goes, hey, where do you think we get some bread for these guys to eat? Like he knew that there, he knew they couldn't. And, said, and he said this to prove them. Like he was having at them. I do that to people all the time, and I feel very holy. Thank you, Mark, for that one little bit of laughter. Nathan, I had to work on you, brother. He said, for he knew himself what he would do. And Philip answered him, uh, we've got 200 penny worth of bread. It's not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's, uh, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. So Jesus didn't do this all on his own. Peter was a connector. That's a, that's a special gift. You ever know there's people that can connect people? That's just such a gift. He connected Jesus to the person he'd work a miracle through. And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. 
Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in the number about 5,000. And, and of course, another, other thing says, beside women and children, there's probably 15,000 people there. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sit down. So the disciples became waiters. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he saith unto his disciples, and before I even read this, can you imagine distributing food to that, that many people? How tired you would be? People just think, if I could only have walked the shores of Galilee with Jesus. That was a hard job walking with Jesus, man. He hardly ever slept. Guys, guys demanding. And you come and say, hey, we're in trouble. We're about to sink. And he gets up and stills the sea. And you're sitting, while you're in awe, he's sitting there chewing you out. What's wrong with your faith? When they were filled, he saith unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. So they have just a few things. Few loaves, few fishes, they feed a multitude. And then he says, gather up the fragments. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So while they're distributing the food and it's multiplying, it multiplied so much they had leftovers. Now you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't say, yeah, I'll leave it for the birds. He said, gather it up. God hates waste. Now he really does. He hates waste and being wasteful. That is a, that, listen, it's just a, it's a financial understanding that's biblical. I remember Dr. Dr. Uh, Paul Cho, he came to a Raymond Bible Training Center, the largest church in the world. And he was talking about how God hates waste and how it was, um, it was summertime. And summertime in Oklahoma, it's like, you just have to be out of your mind to be there. <laughs> it's just bad. Like you can't, you, we would go to the lake and you'd get out of the water and you're immediately hot and you're wet, not from the water, but from the humidity. And it was just unbearable, unless you were in the house. It was just unbearable. What was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Uh, waste. waste. I was thinking about Oklahoma, and I was like, man. I was thinking, I was thinking about that lake. And the chicken fights. We're doing chicken fights. <laughs> Anyways, so he's in this hotel... And they have the air conditioning on because you had to have it on, but they had the fireplace on for ambiance. It's a nice hotel. So they had the fireplace on for ambiance, the air conditioning goes. And he looked at that and he thought, that's wasteful. So God hates waste. And, and I, I think somebody like that might have, you know, an idea about that. He gathered up the fragments well, Bob, uh, God, doesn't, God doesn't do that anymore, that kind of stuff. Yeah, he does. When I was in Uganda, I was reading this book about this apostle, Simeon Kaiua. And I read the book, and I, I told my friend Clyde, I said, I said, we got to go meet this guy. And he goes, well, we are. He says, we're going to interview him, and then we're going to give him a doctorate, and um, an honorary doctorate. So... I did the most questions because I had read his book. But I, and I talked to his people afterwards, after we did the doctorate thing. But he's called the father of the born-again movement. When he was just a young, a young person, Jesus appeared to him in a vision. And he said, read Isaiah 61. And he said, I'm going to use you to deliver my people. And he was the one that prophesied the death of Idi Amin. Now, if you're young, you don't even know what a dictator is. But, you know, not, not real. You know, Castro's bad. No, Idi Amin was bad. But he was the worst dictator in the world. People in Uganda, like cab drivers, people we've talked to, they go, yeah, I remember, my, I remember the men were hiding in the trees because they would kill them if they saw them. They just killed the men. And, um, 
and his dad was, his dad was uh, captive, and he was handcuffed to another guy, and somebody paid for them to get out of there, and so they, they, you know, they, they took them out of there. So his dad lived because he was handcuffed to this guy. It's the only reason. And he goes, sometimes the guys would go, they had such a spirit of murder on them, they go, oh, my head hurts. I, I need to kill somebody. There was such a spirit of murder. Idi Amin was awful. And the Lord showed him, he said, I want you to go to this, this place, this rock, and he goes, I want you to prophesy his death. And he goes there, and all these people come out. Then he didn't, wasn't there with the bullhorn saying, come out, I got something to say. But they had all had visions of this guy prophesying the death of Idi Amin. This guy's a, he's a great, great man. Yes, he only raised 11 people from the dead. So what? <laughs> so that's not that much, but that's still something. How many have you raised from the dead? And I met some of the people he raised from the dead. Yes, when I was in heaven, when I died. And... But anyways, I'm bringing him up because he had multiplication. One of them was a mango tree. So during Idi Amin's reign, there was you know, no food. People were starving. Um, I'm not going to call him Joe Biden. But anyways, people were starving. Food prices had doubled. <laughs> no. And um, they got some fish from the Catholic church, which was rotten, so he couldn't feed his people. And there were 400 people living in his church so that they wouldn't get murdered by Idi Amin's men because they wouldn't go into the church. And so he said, God, what am I going to do? And he said, speak to the mango tree. Remember when Jesus spoke to the, the fig tree and it died? He said, speak to the mango tree. Well, that mango tree had been there for years and never had a single mango. So he speaks to the mango tree. Within a week, it was full of mangoes. And it produced mangoes continuously until the day that Idi Amin's regime fell. Then <clears throat> they were doing a fast. And, I, and listen, I talked to a lot of people in the church. Like the press came in and interviewed us. This guy, is, he was, he's a nationally known figure in Uganda. The press were interviewing us about the doctorate. So I got to talk to a lot of people in this church. And he called a fast, and the people that did a fast, they were going to break the fast together. So they made 400 sandwiches so that people could break the fast, but 800 people showed up. And they said, Simeon, what are we going to do? So There's 800 people, and they said, don't worry about it. So all 800 people had sandwiches, and the young guys had like five. I remember when I was 17 one time, I was so hungry. Yes, you, we were working out like maniacs, and you know, your, your metabolism fast. I ate for four hours straight. My God bless my parents. <laughs> so young guys could eat a lot. And they just, people just kept eating sandwiches, and, but there were sandwiches left over because they just multiplied. So that's, I'm just giving you a modern day. You say, well, you know, that sounds like a fairy tale. No, something that happened. And here's the thing. I, if I was one of the disciples, I would have said, well, why pick up the scraps? Just multiply some other food down the road. No, pick up the scraps. We'll use them. That's a financial understanding that all of us should have. Don't be wasteful. Don't buy everything you see online. But I have to have it. Then you get it and go, it's not what I thought. And then you throw it away. Right. Beloved, I pray or I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. I need you to understand this, that all poverty everywhere on the earth is not of God. It's demonic. Yes. When people say, Bob... How could God allow those people, starving people in India and other places? Well, he doesn't. If you grew up in a traditional church, you're, you're saying, God, God's in control. Take the wheel, Jesus. You are so stupid spiritually. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel? No, you take the wheel. He gave the wheel to you. Listen, Genesis 1.26 says God gave authority on the earth to men. So you have the authority. 
You're sitting there begging God to do something. He's saying, you do it. You speak to it. Jesus spoke to the tree himself. When Jesus sent his men out, they did the same things he did. They weren't even born again. Why? Because you have authority and you have dominion. Listen, it's fun to make... For me, it's fun to make fun of some of the really stupid stuff that some of the Democrats are doing. But... You have to understand, that's just in fun, but you can't sit around talking like that all the time. You have to speak to the economy. You have to start speaking to things, declaring the will of God. If Satan can get, and when I say Satan, there are territorial spirits that influence territories. That's why you go to a different territory and people, there's a different spirit about them. You know, you go to New York and everybody's like, they're all hyped up. I remember I was, I, was, uh, I was in Detroit and I was, picking, uh, I was picking Lance Walnow up from the airport because nobody else knew who he was. And that's when you could actually walk into the airports. And I remember walking in and you could see all these, all these Eastern people getting off, the, getting off the plane. They're all like hyped up. They got high waters. You know, they're wearing high waters. And I was just laughing at it. I was laughing at the, the Eastern people. And of course, they'd probably laugh at us like... So these spirits have an effect, and they get everybody saying the same thing. And what happens is everybody starts prophesying death. People say, this is bad, isn't it? Yeah, it's really bad. No, it's worse. I agree, it's worse. You know? And so you get all this kind of demonic conversation, and it has an effect on where we are. Now, if you go to countries where they worship false gods, you get extreme poverty. Because they worship these false gods to get something, but when you give false gods the right to enter into your life or to your nation, they bring extreme poverty. Because false gods want to murder you. The reason America was so prosperous, and still is, is because of all the people that worship God. All right. I see nobody believes that, but it's true anyways. Let's receive the offering today. So if you're making out checks, please make them out to the gathering place. Those that give to Soaring Ministries, the same thing and up there on the, the board. If you want to text it in, you can scroll down either one of those. And let's pray this with me. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the abundant provision that you have made for us here in America, here in California. We thank you for all your blessings in our lives. Lord Jesus, you are my brother. You are my Savior. I am one with you. I am your body, and you are my high priest. As my high priest, receive my tithe and offering, present it unto the Father as an offering in righteousness, as a sweet savor. Father, I humble myself, because you know what it says in Malachi, he says, prove me. I humble myself by proving you in this way, and I receive the opening of the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing there's not room enough to receive. And I thank you that you're rebuking the devourer for our sakes. Amen. Go ahead, ushers, and receive the offering. While they're doing that, let me get slightly, slightly political. Uh, we are going to put, we are going to put price caps on food. Yeah, I have to work on that. I have to, how does she talk? It's a weird cadence to it. But <clears throat> hard for me to do the high pitched sounds. But they're they're price gauging. They're price gauging. I think she meant to say gouging. But when you're drunk, it's hard to think. 
Everywhere they've ever put price caps on anything, it has destroyed the economy. And anybody with half a brain knows that. Amen. So I'm not sure this person is even going to make it to the election. Because right. once the stupid ideas come out and people hear them, they're going to go, ah, she's not going to make it. Nope. So listen, you got a lot of praying to do. It's the most important election we've ever been in. And, and I'm not even trying to be mean about any of this, but I'm saying, I'm saying this, and this is for the future generations. Bob, you've got to have compassion for homosexuality and trans people, and I do. But you know what? You can't say it's okay because then what you're telling, you're telling the next generation, hey, this is socially a good thing to do, and it's not because it destroys your life and it destroys your future. So we can't accept it. And you can't, you can't tell young men and women, it's okay to murder the babies in the womb. It's not okay. Nope. Amen. You're taking a life that doesn't belong to you. Right. Well, it's my body. No, no. You use your body and you received a child. Now that child has its own body. Yeah. So now that belongs to the child. Yeah. And that child belongs to God. <laughs> and so you can't discard it. It's pretty popular here. <laughs> this is what Bob Jones saw in the 1970s, a great prophet, been to heaven, many visitations from the Lord. And he told him, he said, there's two things that are coming. They're going to try to destroy this country. The number one thing was abortion. And he said, they're, they're going to even have a pill for it. And he said, number two is the homosexual re revolution, he even say the trans. And he said, there's going to come a disease along with it. And they go, they're not going to cure it until they stop doing it. In other words, it, in other words it's something that has to stop. Yeah. So we can't encourage and say, no, it's okay. It's not okay. No. I may love you and I may, I may care for you as a friend. I may pray for you. But I cannot accept that the behavior is okay. Because yeah. it is an abomination I was talking to Nora about abominations. You know, there's, there's, oh, there's seven abominations. Says, yeah. I go, obviously the giants, you know, when the giants, when the, these sons of God, these watchers that had flesh came down and they were mixing among men, that they had relations with women and they brought forth giants. Now, being an American that went to public schools, you have no comprehension of actual history. You don't know anything about actual history of America. You don't know that the Capitol building was used as a church. You don't know that Thomas Jefferson gave different Bibles to the Native Americans than he did to the Congress. To the Native Americans, he gave the full New Testaments. He believed in evangelizing them. But to the Congress, he just gave the ethics of Jesus. No, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. No, it doesn't look like it from his history. There's so many things we've been lied to about in this nation. And you know, until it was, it was the late, it was the late 1800s that we actually taught actual history, but around somewhere around 1890, and I, I don't remember the exact person that did it, but they changed history from actual history to financial history. Well, we know that the love of money is the root of all evil. So it changed to Satan's history changed from actual history to Satan's foundation. I mean, you go back and you look at some of the old uh, school books that they used. And they used the Bible. And you know where the schools were? They were the churches. You know, not that I've watched a lot of Little House on the Prairie because at the time I was smoking too much dope, but <laughs> listening to rock. I'll never forget, it was in Anaheim Stadium. I was like 17 years old and I was, I was hitting a joint. And I got whacked so hard on my shoulder. And I just, I turned around and I was just going to start throwing because I was that way back then. And there's this huge highway patrolman on the seats up, above. There was a couple of them. And here I was with a joint in my hand. You know, I was with this hand. I was ready to throw with this hand. And I just threw the joint down. <laughs> I thought better of swinging on that guy. But thankfully, they just threw us out. 
So we bought some more tickets and came in another entrance. Anyways. <laughs> let's, let's read some scripture instead of telling bad stories. I'm going to just touch base on a little bit of what we talked about last week because we talked about call to abide in Him. And it really goes along with what we taught this, this Thursday, this last Thursday. And if, um, if I remember, if I don't remember Herb, you can remind me. I'm going to have Herb share, share a little bit of a story of somebody who's very prophetic, had kind of a vision for our church. And it's something that I've been praying about a lot. So I believe the vision is in alignment with my prayers, and I believe your prayers. So he said to this in 1 John 2, he said, I write it to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. So we'd say this, that the majority of the church in America are not even little children because the majority of Christians in America have a sin consciousness. They're more conscious of their sin than they are of their righteousness. Jesus gave you righteousness. But there's a lot of people that are battling with a sin consciousness. Hi, you know, I, I better go repent. You know, and, and there's nothing wrong with repenting if you need to do it, but to be in a sin consciousness is a bad place to be. You're, you're, Jesus gave you righteousness, and if you're more aware of your sin than your righteousness, something's wrong. <clears throat> so he said, little children spiritually understand their sins are forgiven. I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. And notice here, you'll notice as we read through the other two, and, and just say, Bob, he's just saying fathers, he didn't say women, just put it in there, listen. Don't, don't get caught up in that whole thing. Well, what about the women? Men and womb, wombed men, same thing. Not exactly, but you understand what, I, you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I am a woman. I may not have a womb. I write, <laughs> I write unto you fathers because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write, I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And then he goes back to children. So he gives three levels of growth. These are three levels of spiritual growth. I write unto you young men oh, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children because you have known the father. So little children have two attributes. They're, they understand forgiveness, that they're forgiven, and they have known the Father. I have written unto you fathers, he goes back to the fathers, because you have known him this from the beginning. Exact same thing. The, the thing that makes somebody a spiritual father is the close walk they have with God. Not how long they've been around or how good their theology is or anything like that. I have written unto you young men because you are strong. Same thing, but a little bit more. And the word of God abides in you. And you've overcome the wicked one. So young men have overcome the demonic, but they're also full of the word of God. Peter says this, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. So you don't, when somebody's a new Christian, you don't feed them like heavy doctrine about demons or things like that or about seeing into the future you know you give them simple stuff that they're the righteousness of god things like that so we see here are the three levels sins are forgiven you've known the father overcome the wicked one strong the word of god abides in you you have known him that is from the beginning those are the levels and we went over that last week and he says this in 1 John 2, 27, 28. The anointing which you have received of him abides in you. Need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teach you. No, if we don't need anybody to teach us, why did God give us teachers? He's not saying that you're not going to meetings, you're not being taught. But he's saying is the Holy Spirit can teach you. The Holy Spirit is the anointing. And his truth is no lie, even as it taught you. And this is part of the verse, but I just separated it. You shall abide in him. So the Holy Spirit teaches you how to live in God. We are in a spiritual relationship. The Bible is a love book. It's a book of love letters written to you so that you could have a relationship with God, not so that you could have a theology. When you get really good at theology, you lose all your faith. I remember this woman, um, Connie Ochoa. She, she's, she's gone on to be with the Lord. 
<clears throat> but when I was a very young pastor, um, she was such a woman of prayer. And one of the first demons ever cast out, she was with me. And, and it's back then, you know, it's not something you saw a lot of. But <laughs> this guy takes my hand, you know, and it's like a limp fish. And I went to say, you know, in the name of Jesus, I was going to cast him. In the name of Jesus. But the spirit that was in him was so strong, it bound me. I couldn't even speak. And I said, in the name of Jesus. But just even getting, barely getting it out, like a whisper, his hand just came like a vice. He fell to the floor and starts doing this. So I get down on my knees. And listen, if you're a technique deliverer, you need to go back and listen to Thursday because Jesus cast out devils by the Holy Spirit. Deliverance ministries, people that get, like, hey, we're a deliverance ministry. The problem with that is they usually end up getting demons because they get caught up in the techniques and they lose the person of the Holy Spirit. So he's down on the ground, so I kneel down, and again, I said, in the name of Jesus, come out. <laughs> I can barely talk. And it's getting worse. And it just made me mad at this point. Sometimes you got to get mad. And I pulled my hand out, I grabbed him by the collar, and I slammed him. <laughs> What'd you do that for? I just seemed like the right thing to do. <laughs> and, I, and I was so mad, then I just said, shut up! And then I had my voice. And, and, and <laughs> while this is happening, everybody in the prayer meeting was at the back wall. They all backed away. <laughs> Except for Connie Ochoa. And she's down there, and we cast like seven demons out of this guy. And I had been, and here's the thing, I had been fasting and praying for three days, which is a really good, if you're going to cast out devils, that's a really good thing to have, have been done. You remember what Jesus said when his disciples, they were casting out all kinds of devils, but they couldn't cast a de demon out of the one. And he said, um, well, this kind of only comes out by prayer and fasting. So sometimes you have to, and I just happened to have been in prayer and fasting, just happened to have been. No, the Lord prepared me. I didn't know I was going to have to face this demon. And it's like I was saying on Thursday night, once you cast a demon out, like a, like a full-on demon like that, the atmosphere was just like, whoo. the glory of the Lord was just like, whoo. just felt so good. So the guy who cast the demons out of goes, Pastor Bob, I was in a real bad car accident. My back's all messed up. I remember going, just literally, be healed. Like I was just like this, just, be healed. And everybody there will testify. His whole back just went right back in place. Why? Because of the glory, it's the glory of the Lord. That's what we're pushing toward, my dear friends. But I was talking about Connie Ocho because the Lord spoke to her and he said, man, she, boy, she could hear the Lord. She would get such great words of knowledge. She, had, she was a prayer warrior and she would really hear the Lord clearly. And she said, Bob, you know what the Lord told me? Because she wasn't like she wasn't super educated. She said, You know what the Lord told me? He said, He said, Connie, you hear you hear me better than a lot of pastors. And I said to her, I said, I, I agree, you do hear the Lord better than a lot of pastors. She don't think you hear him better than me. No, but at the time, <laughs> at the time, I'm pretty sure she did hear him better than me. <clears throat> now, she's one of the ones she she prophesied, she goes, Bob, God's gonna give you a house at the beach. Now, I'll be honest with you, I did nothing, nothing, almost nothing in procuring the house at the beach, except the heavy lifting. <laughs> I remember bringing this heavy dresser upstairs, my son and I, I hate stairs, and so I'm balancing with one hand here, and I'm at the, I've got the weight of the whole thing, because he's balancing the top, just in my fingertips. And Kim's going, was that heavy for you? <laughs> I said, I'm carrying the whole thing on my fingertips. <laughs> All right. So Connie Ochoa, she wasn't a theologian, but she was a great woman, and she could hear the voice of God. Now, little children, abide in him. When he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be shamed before, before him at his coming. So it's about abiding, abiding in him. 
The anointing teaches you how to abide in him. Now, I'm passing some of this up because we read some of it last week. Do I need to even read this? Let's see. So Jesus, this is the prayer he's praying. I really just go down to verse 3. He said, this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So that's his prayer, or at least part of his prayer, is that we know him. And he said, I don't pray for these alone, but for them also, which should believe on me through their word. That they may all be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That thou also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you have sent me. Hmm. They may be one. Father, art in me. As thou, Father, art in me, I in thee. They also may be one in us. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Well, that really sounds like somebody who's one with God. Like you go into somebody else saying, hey, could, could you bless me? Because I, I don't have that kind of relationship with the Father. The Bible says, all will know me from the least to the greatest. That's why the priesthood died 2,000 years ago. When Paul's going through the ministry gifts, he doesn't list the priesthood. Because the priesthood was the law. As a matter of fact, there was no priesthood with Abraham. Well, that's not exactly true. There was Melchizedek who was the high priest, who Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. But I'm the body of Christ. That puts me in the priesthood category. That's why it says in Revelation 1.6, you're all kings and priests. So I am a priest. Why would I go to a priest? Yeah. Bob, you are my priest. Even though you're my pastor, you're my priest, so I'm coming to you. <laughs> well, what if I want to come to you? Because you're a priest as well. So what are the gifts? He said, God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So we're all priests. And the thing is, and and listen, I don't want to pick on the Catholic Church too much because how many people go to their pastors as their priests? They make them their priests. So I'm going to ask you this question. Who do I go to? To the Lord. If I go to you and I say, could you pray for me? I'm in trouble. You go, oh my God, the pastor's in trouble. What? If he's in trouble, what am I going to do? You know. All right, we can skip some of this. Because uh, I'm going to try to hit, I'm going to try to go a little bit further today than we did last week on this. And again, if you weren't here Thursday, <clears throat> the quintessential truth about releasing the glory of God is in Matthew 12, verse, verse 22 to verse 30. Now, you should have memorized that years ago, but you didn't know what it was because Jesus tells how to bring in a move of God. And it goes back to what he did in Matthew 4 after his 40-day fast. But that's something we'll touch on in a moment. So he says here, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to what? I separated this because I wanted you to see the separation. He didn't send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So if I'm living in condemnation, what's going on? It means I'm believing in a lie. I'm believing a false doctrine. Remember, Proverbs 9. Verse 13, Passion Translation, there's a spirit called folly. The King James says there's a woman, a foolish woman. But then she goes to all the same high places that the spirit of wisdom does. So she's a counterpart to wisdom. This spirit of folly is a counterpart to wisdom. I know I said this, I probably said it the other night because I've been thinking about it. But when I was talking to Ian about it, we were talking about the spirit of wisdom, and I said... And I was talking about how that ninth chapter of Proverbs, this woman, this folly, this spirit of folly, is the counterpart to the spirit of wisdom. Which, by the way, if you listen to last week, you will know that the Holy Ghost always works with wisdom. That wisdom was one of the mentors of Jesus, because the Holy Ghost 
didn't. He wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost until he was 30, who was mentoring him. said he grew in wisdom and stature. And then, <clears throat> in Isaiah 11, he said there's going to be a tender root. And he said, I'm going to put these seven spirits on him. Who do you think mentored Jesus when he was growing up? Okay. A little side note. He that believes on him is not condemned. Well, if you're condemned, what are you believing? You're believing that false doctrine. You're believing the spirit of folly. Because the spirit of folly, as Ian said, is a religious spirit. The religious spirit is you have to do something. Hey, you got to do something. What for? To be holy. Okay. So what, do you, what should I do? I don't know. Let me make something up. No, I'm serious. You go into a lot of churches, and they just make stuff up. It's not even in the Bible. No, that's true. It's not in the Bible. People make stuff up. Oh, well, you should do this. Well, it's a good reason to do that. No. It's all about the relationship. It was funny. My, my bank app, or the church, you know, for the church bank app, it just went out on me, and I called up. I'm trying to get it. I couldn't get, it, couldn't get anything done. Did, did you get upset, Bob? No. Because you never know. Sometimes when things don't go right, God has a reason. <clears throat> so I ended up having to go to the bank yesterday over in Chatsworth. <clears throat> and I go in there, and it's, a, it's a, a young kid, and I know him. I shouldn't say kid. He's probably mid-20s. But he's a young guy. And, um, you know, we're talking. We greet each other. And he goes, so how do you... How do, you start a, how do you start a business like a church? I go, well, I go, in America, the church is a non-profit. I go, which is a shame because it should be, it should be profit. But the demon somehow whittled that in there. And um, the Catholic is a, a corporation soul. They're not a non-profit at all. That's why they have billions of dollars. Um, but that didn't work that well for them, to be honest. <laughs> I guess we have a lot of lawsuits. Maybe it's good. But so we're st- we're talking, and, and um, I said I said you know so he's talking about how did you start a business? And I said I said you know I go the richest man that ever lived was was Solomon. And I said he had the wisdom of God, and that's how he became. And I was just it was like a casual. It wasn't like trying to witness to him. It was like a casual conversation. And I said you know the father of faith was Abraham. He was the world's first multi billionaire. And, and we're, just, we're just talking. He goes, well, I, um, I believe if you're a good person. And I said, no, it's exactly the opposite of what you believe. <laughs> I said, it's not about how good you are. I said, he's already been good for you. I said, he was already good so that you don't have to be. I said, I'm not saying not to be good. I said, but he was good because you can't be good enough. Because one of the things, and what, what led to that was he goes, well, I'm not religious. I go, oh, thank God, neither am I. <laughs> and I start talking to him about the Bible is a book about relationships. It's about our relationship with God. And I go, God wants to be your friend. He loves you and he wants to be your friend. He wants to have a relationship with you. And he was just eating it up. And we're just going back. We're just going back and forth. And then, you know, the transaction was done, and I, and I left. Bob, did you lead him to Christ? No, but I'll see him again. And if I don't, somebody else will. But I planted a seed. And that's what, see, that's where people think, I, I want to tell you about Jesus. He loves you, you know. <laughs> How about having a conversation with somebody where they actually believe that you have some care for them? Every place I ever worked, I witnessed to everyone. When I worked at the phone company, and it was funny because I was, telling, I, was, I was talking to the train conductor last week. Now, oh, how's your job, you know? I just have, have casual conversations with people. It opens up doors. I said, you know, how's your, how's your job? And he goes, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty good except for the people. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. I go, you know, I go, years ago I found out who people were because I worked for 411. 
you know, the telephone company, it was General Telephone back then. You had to start out. I had to work for 411 for a year. <clears throat> and and uh, if you're younger, you don't know what that is, but uh, people would call in and say, what city, please? And then they'd you know, give you the city. Then you'd look up the numbers for them. And um, <clears throat> I witnessed, uh, there were hundreds of people. I witnessed every single person there over time just by accident. Wherever, you, wherever you're at is an open door. Wherever you work. Just, you just meet people, and I remember working in this machine shop when I was in Bible school. There's a couple of young guys there, they worked on the, the line with me. And I just became friends with them and, and witnessed, you know, just, I would talk to them about God. And they all ended up getting saved. And I remember, I remember going to a meeting, there was one girl at the, the phone company. She wasn't saved when I left, but I was in a, went to a big, it was a big, like, a meeting at church on the way, some kind of special meeting. Um, there she was, and she comes up, and she hugs me. Bob, I got saved. <laughs> so you never know the seeds you plant. But I don't tell people about religion. I just tell them about my relationship with God, which is easy because it's true. Like, he's my best friend. I hang out with him. I sing songs. I tell him cheesy jokes. <laughs> I gave him advice on what he should have done differently in the Bible. I said, God, I would have done this. <laughs> and then he shows me why it's really stupid. Anyways, so Romans 8 says, and I know you know this, but we're just going to read through it real quickly. There's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. So we know that. We just don't believe it. But it's true. The case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. Well, Bob, what if I go out and I get drunk and then, and, and, uh, you know, well, repent and uh, there's no condemnation. No, I need to feel bad for three weeks. No, you don't. If you feel bad for three weeks, you're going to go get drunk again. That's true. People, they get into condemnation and the condemnation makes you, pulls you away from God. You just have to immediately go to God and say, I feel like an idiot, but I know you're good. And he is. In John 3, and I love this passage, 1 John 3. Hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemn us, ooh, what? Let's just do a little something here. I'm a little low on funds, so I need to, I need to sell some paintings. I'm going to give a discount, 15000 on this one. If I could do a thumbprint, there's my thumbprint, and see, there, all that great stuff. If I could spit and make it better, it would, you know. I'm taking lessons from Hunter. So, your heart, in the Greek, is cardia. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, is what Jesus said. So he didn't say out of your spirit, and of course they weren't even born again at this point, but out of the abundance of your heart, so what you meditate on. So your heart is not your spirit. Your spirit is who you are, and it's something different. So whenever you're feeling really righteous and upright and close to God, that's your spirit. When you're not feeling that, that's your soul. So we have to minister to our soul. And I'm actually, I'm going through the scriptures. I've got got a good teaching down the road. It's going to be on how to minister to your soul. But the, the heart is really kind of a combination of your spirit, soul, and your body. And do you know that you're supposed to minister to all, all of them? Now, how do you feed your spirit? Praying in the spirit and the word of God. How do you feed your soul? Praying in the spirit and the word of God. How do you feed your body? A really good steak? No, I mean... It's funny in America, we're so stupid sometimes. We have these hardcore exercise stuff. It's like, you know, they, they can take the Gatorade and, you know, they're pounding, the guys pounding the tire and everything. But the funny thing is, you burn more actual fat doing a casual walk. Not a fast walk, by the way. They found this, they, they, they found this in studies in the Scandinavian countries that people that are casually walking because you're not, you're not using the glucose 
or the glycogen in your body, uh, so you end up using your fat. So, so people say, fun, and there's a brisk walk. Well, that's fine. You'll burn calories and everything, but a casual walk actually burns more fat. The people that burn the most fat are people like this. Fidget, oh, that's true. Fidgety people burn the most fat. So if you're a fidgety person, you're probably going to be really lean unless you just eat like a, you know, unless you eat a lot. But, you know, before television and radio and all the modern stuff we have, people didn't sit for hours and hours because you'd be bored. And you'd be you know, pounding your head on the desk. So people were up moving around. And, of course, they didn't have 57 additives to their food. You know, you got Heinz ketchup from uh, Canada, tomato paste, vinegar, I think two, three ingredients. Uh, Heinz tomato, uh, Heinz ketchup from America, Hydro, but I, no, yeah, yeah, 37 ingredients. There's something not right about that. So you have to, you have to think, in America, you've got to think about how you minister to your body. You do. You have to think about ministering to your body because you want to have strength. You know, you want to, and, and was it Thomas Jefferson? That guy studied like 14 hours a day. He was a, that guy was a true genius. Him and Benjamin Franklin, true, two true geniuses. But he would get up when he get like he get he get up and he'd go and he'd run a mile. He just understood that the body needed to to, to move. That the and you know he didn't understand a lot of things we do today, but he understood that. Anyways, so when we go back here. Whoops, not there. Here. when that does that to me. Okay. Shh. I'm in church and be quiet and respectful. Okay. <laughs> That's so funny because in the early church they always got results and they were yelling and screaming and blowing chauffeurs. Hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him, for if our heart condemn us. So your own heart can condemn you. And let me tell you how it condemns you. It tells you everything you haven't done for God. Or you did this to this person here. Or you're living in some kind of, um, and I won't say even unforgiveness, but rejection. I've been rejected. You know, everybody's been rejected. There are times people reject you, they don't even realize they're doing it, but you, you, know, you feel rejected. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart. So your heart can condemn you, but that's when you go to God because he's greater than your heart, and that's where you overcome the condemnation. Listen, condemnation is the, is the power that works in you to destroy your faith. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not. Oh, well, that's a good saying. Then have we confidence toward God, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. So if I want my prayers to be answered, I have to have a heart that's free of condemnation. Amen. That means that if I pray and I'm not getting my prayers answered, I need to go to God and say, what is condemning me? And get it out of me. Yeah. Or I turn it over to you. Do not allow yourself to live in condemnation. Honestly, it's a sin to allow yourself to live in condemnation because Jesus paid the price so there'd be no condemnation. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, love one another. That's the commandment. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of commandments. In the New Testament, believe on Jesus, love one another. That's the commandments we keep. Other than that, you're good. 2 Corinthians 3 Verse 6, who has also made us ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit does what? Gives life. It's the Holy Spirit. But if the ministration or the ministry of death written and graven in stones, what was written and graven in stones? But what specifically? Ten commandments. Ten commandments. Oh, Bob, the, the Ten Commandments are holy. We need to follow them. You don't even know what they are. No, I'm serious. There's no grace for you to know what the Ten Commandments are. Now, it's not that they're bad. 
And if you're making laws for the land, they're really good. But you are no longer under the Ten Commandments. Why? Because you have a greater commandment. Believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, love one another. If I love you, I'm not going to kill you, I'm not going to steal from you, all those kind of things. So he talks about the ministry of death, written and graven in stones. That means if I follow the old ways, even though they were glorious, so the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. If I follow that, that's the ministry of death. How shall not the ministration or the ministry of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation... well. Bob, if God gave the law to Moses and it's the ministry of condemnation, why did he do it? He said he did it because of the abundance of sin. So quick, quick question to you. In the scripture, who's called the father of faith? Abraham is the father of faith. Did God give Abraham any laws? Did he have any commandments? Did he have anything written down? No. How do we even know about Abraham? Because God spoke to Moses. Now, they traditionally knew who he was, but Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Technically, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible, the first written book, but the five books were written by Moses. Abraham had no law. What did he have? He had an encounter with Melchizedek where he gave him tithe of all, and Melchizedek gave him the communion, showed him the Lord, That's why Abraham said, or Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and was glad. So he was taken out of condemnation. Well, why did God give the law? Abundance of sin. But you know what he did when he gave the law? Knowing that they could not keep it. And by the way, he gave them the lowest level of the law. Like, he didn't even make it hard. Remember what Jesus is saying? You know, if you, if you kill somebody, you've broken the law. Thou shalt not kill. He goes, but I say to you, if you look on somebody and you hate them, you've committed murder in your heart. Oh, wait, that, that seems harder than the other one. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Hey, that, that's harder than the other one. <laughs> what he was saying was, you couldn't even keep the old laws what if, what if you really got the real truth? He goes, you couldn't even come close to keeping it. We, we can't keep it. That's what Jesus is all about. Because it was never about doing religious services. It was about having that wonderful relationship with Him. When I pray in the Holy Spirit, it's not like I'm doing a duty. When I pray in Kula Mabaha Shakaha Rendia, I'm not doing a duty. I'm having a relationship with the Holy Spirit, with the Father. I'm having a relationship. That's why I do it. I have a relationship. I remember one year, I was, I was going to drive up to Montana to, to David's, and um, Kim and Kaylee flew up, and then we're going to drive back together. So I was driving up by myself. I remember I was looking so forward to it. I go, I'm going to have all those hours in the car to pray. <laughs> you say, you're such a weirdo. And that's true. And then Sue, Sue said to me, she goes, Bob, I just feel this trip is a gift from God. Like it, it's going to be a blessing to you. And she was so right. So I'm just driving and I'm just praying in the Holy Spirit. It was such, I had such relationship with God that I, I, I was going to get a hotel at one point, and I just, but I just kept feeling so good that I just kept driving. I, you know, of course, Stuart, when you drive, you just can't eat. You, know, you, you eat, eat something, you're... I just kept driving. I think I pulled over for an hour because I thought, well, I should. And then I just, I kept driving. I got there really early the next day. And they're like, how did you get here so fast? Well, I just kept driving. Left church and, uh, you know, about three or four o'clock and I was on. And what a, what a, just a time of relationship. And I was praying the whole time, but it wasn't like, Okay, I'm going to really pray some things through here. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It wasn't anything like that. Was, oh, I, just, I was just having a relationship. That's what prayer is for. Prayer was never, prayer was never meant to, okay, I've got to do my daily prayers. Father, give me grace in Jesus' name. And, 
and, and, and, you know, and, and bless my children, and, 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 and uh, God, please help them get the five freeway, make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's, prayer is your relationship. We hear all the ministers going, we need to pray for the president, and we need to pray for this, and, and I'm not saying they're wrong, and we do, but a lot of your prayer is just supposed to be you hanging out with God. And I remember, I'll, I'll tell this story, that there was um, this one time I had spent like three or four days, I was just praying, and I just told Kim, I said, I'm not taking phone calls from anybody. That's back, you know, in the day when they just had those phones. I said, I'm not taking phone calls from anybody, I'm just, I'm just going to be praying for the next several days. And just the only ones I would talk to is my kids and, and her. And um, so about the, about the fourth day, she comes to me and she said, hey, there's like, she brings me like four or five prayer requests. Pretty, like, pretty serious. When you have a big church, you get a lot of prayer requests. And, um, you know, nobody else can pray for them but the pastor. He's the only one. <laughs> you know, what if you're dead tired? And, you know, Father, help them, Father. You know, no, somebody else might be better to pray. But I have these like six or seven requests. I prayed for all of them in about two minutes. Like four or five of them were answered within a week. Why? I was in such communion with God. It was like, oh, Father, do this. Can you do this? Oh, can you do this? Yeah. Because the communion was so close. Now think about this. You had three million Israelites. How many of them were really affecting God? Oh, well, maybe to some degree, some of them. But... Moses would have a conversation with God and God would change his whole mind. Like God got mad at the Israelites because they were so bad. And he goes, leave me alone, Moses. I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses says, no, no, no. <laughs> you can't talk to God like that. Yeah, Moses, no, 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 no. See, people think, hey, you think you can't have conversations with God to change his mind about things? You're wrong. Well, I just do what the Lord tells me, Bob. Well, no, I don't just do what the Lord tells me. I tell him some things. Who do you think you are? Well, I think I'm a son of God, you know. That's what Moses did. Moses wasn't even born again. And then he said, you know, he says, you know, that if you do that, he goes, Moses, I'll make of you a great nation. He goes, no, you know, if you do that, all these other nations say you delivered them so you could kill them in the desert. And he, was, he had God's back. Same with Abraham when God says, hey, we better not keep the secret from Abraham since he's going to be a great man and, and uh, kings will come out of him. And, and he said, uh, okay, because they just had lunch with him. They're hanging around with him for several hours, probably half a day. <laughs> Can you imagine the Lord comes and he's having dinner with you? No, I'll have, the, I'll have the, that one there. No, no, no more salad. You know. <laughs> I can't believe I created that stuff. And then Jesus says, you know, where's the Oreos? Oh, well, they haven't been created yet. Anyways. <laughs> so the Lord's hanging out with him, and, and the angels are going over to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it because it's a portal of darkness. And he goes, and he says, hey, listen, I, I got I to gotta wipe that city out or it's going to infest the whole earth. And God doesn't have to do that now. He just can send an evangelist and prayer warriors, and they can change the culture. But he said, they're going to infest the whole earth, so I'll have to destroy it. And Abraham said, well, you know, what if there's 50 righteous people there? He goes, all right, if there's 50, I want to, well, well, wait a minute, hold on, not so fast, how about, how about 45? And he gets them down to 10. But wasn't the will of God, the will of God was, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. That was the will of God. That was the will of God. Abraham was subverting the will of God by asking him again and again to bring the amount of people lower. And God agreed with him every single time. We're sitting there going, God, if I could just hear you. Abraham wasn't even born again. He wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost. But he had a righteousness consciousness where he could talk to God. And he's talking to him face to face. I guess that's pretty good. And he gets him down to 10 but it was the will of God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. 
However, the will of God would have changed had he gone lower. So maybe it was the will of God for him to intercede and bring it all the way down to five. Uh, maybe there's some things that are going to be... Dis- I, I, listen, I'm almost ready to kick some of these prophets. I mean, literally, I want to go to their house and just say, hey, have you ever, have you ever sparred? Come on, you put the gloves on. I'm going to kick you in the head. <clears throat> Can you still kick in the head? I'll kick their knee, you know. <clears throat> it's like they're just so much doom and gloom. It's like, come on, man. How about, how about thinking that we can intercede to subvert some of this stuff? You know? And listen, I believe that we did. Last week at the end of the meeting, and I, I, I didn't say this at the time, but the prophet's anointing came on me and I prophesied over the state of California. And I believe my prophecies more than anybody else. Who do you think you are about? Because they usually come to pass. <clears throat> And I trained under a great prophet. So I usually know, I know when there's a prophet's anointing. Doesn't matter the size of this church. Don't worry about that. When it's in the thousands, you go, Bob, this is a great church. No, it was great now. It's because the prayer warriors. And this prophecy was that God said, I'm wounding the strong man. And the prophet's anointing that came on me, I know that anointing. I'm not a prophet all the time. Kim Clement was a prophet all the time. Like, you'd be sitting at dinner, and he'd start telling me about people at the other tables. He'd start telling me things about their lives. He just was a prophet all the time. I'm not a prophet all the time. But some of you walk in, and I just go, oh, my God, I can't believe they're doing that. You know, I keep it, I keep it to myself. <laughs> I just go home and pray for you. Now, uh, <laughs> I'm just having fun, because some people are going, oh, does he really know what I'm doing? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, and to be honest, I don't want to know. But the prophet's anointing came on me. I started prophesying over California, and I saw four angels, massive angels, surrounding the Capitol building in Sacramento. And I saw the prince over Sacramento. His leg, one of his legs was taken out, and he was wounded. And I didn't see him completely taken out, but I saw him brought down. In other words, the level of control is going to be something different. On a Thursday night, the same spirit of prophecy came, and it's about the weather in California that we're going to start to see some unusual weather patterns and things that are taking place here in the state of California. So when you see unusual weather and they go, it's climate change or anything else, no, no, it's the prophetic. You know it, you know it in advance. All right. Oh, my God, I'm out of time. Uh, let me skip down. I'm going to skip some of this. Let me read this one, at least, this one passage. Jesus said this. He said, I am I'm the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean to the word which I have spoken unto you. They hadn't even been born again, remember. But he said this. He said, abide in me. Live in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Like when I was witnessing to that guy at the bank yesterday. I wasn't even trying. It just was coming out. Because I used to be like that. I used to, I used to think, okay, we've got to go witness. And we get our church and we go out on a Saturday or something. Or we go out on a day and, and we'd knock on doors. And I want to tell you about Jesus. And we got some results. Or we go to the park we, or the malls. We talk to people. <clears throat> and you can do that. I, I'm going to be honest. I hate that stuff. Like, I hate it. But you know what I love? You just go out and you just get in conversations. And because God's such a part of my life, it just naturally comes out. There's no, you know, there's no contrived conversation. It just comes out and you're talking to people about God and about His goodness and, and things that He does. He said, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I'm going to ask you a question. As far as people, 
Who were Jesus' biggest adversaries when he walked the earth? The the scribes and the Pharisees. In other words, the religious leaders. The religious leaders were his worst enemies. When the guy's sitting there with a withered hand, I mean, if you're the guy with a withered hand, you really love Jesus, but you're not so sure about these other guys. And he said to them, is it legal to heal this man on the Sabbath or not? They look at him and they go, well, they're thinking, well, if we answer this, he's going to say this. So they wouldn't answer him. They said he looked on them with anger. But Jesus, Bob, he's sweet. He never got angry. You've never met him, have you? He looked on them with anger. And they turn around and like right in there. It's like a Donald Trump, like right in their face. He said, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it forth. Like right in their face. And they said, then they left, seeing how they could destroy him. I mean, who was the one to pronounce death on him? It was the high priest of Israel. He had to do it anyways, but he did it out of a wrong heart. Religion is not relationship. Abiding in him is different than having a religion. I'm going to be honest. If you abide in him, you will need me less. If you don't abide in Him, you'll need me more. Now, I I love being friends with you, but I want you to have that close relationship with Him. And then we can just have friendships. Then if you get mad at something I say and leave the church, we can still be friends. (laughs) No, Bob, I'm throwing peaches at you. I like peaches. All right, I think, that's, I think that's enough, probably. Um, yeah, we don't need to go through this. That's just too much. Let me just read this last. That's the bread of life stuff, you know. <laughs> we can save that for another day. But I want to read this to you. But we all with open face, that means unveiled face, beholding it as a glass or mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And that means the Spirit of the Lord Jesus. So he said as, as we look at him, as we have a relationship with him, we become him. That's how you can do what Abraham did. That's how you can do what Moses did. You can say, Lord, I want a different outcome in this situation. Yeah, but this is my will. Yeah, I want a different outcome. Remember when Hezekiah prayed? Isaiah the prophet comes to him and he says, you're going to die. He puts his face to the wall and he prays. He cries out. Before the prophets, even out of the courtyard, God speaks to him and he goes back to him and he said, God's giving you 15 more years. You can change God's mind on some stuff. But here it says become the image of God. If a man be in Christ, he will have some sound issues. <laughs> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. If I'm in Christ, my past is my past. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He has made him to be sent for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Everybody say, I have been made. The righteousness of God in Christ. Christ. Last scripture. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. What is your Christianity? Your Christianity is that you will become conformed to the image of his son. In other words, you become the image of his son. So religiousness says, religion says, hey, you need to do all this stuff. You know, keep all, these, keep all these rituals. Follow all these rules. Righteousness says, come close to me and become like me. Yeah. Yeah. The problem with becoming, coming close to him, being like him, you don't have to do all these rituals. So you don't need me to do them. <laughs> I, mean, I can give you rituals if you want something to do. Hey, go mow the lawn here. <clears throat> <laughs> the Lord says that holy is those that mow the lawn. And righteous are those who water it. But 
Thank you, Veronica. I thought that was pretty good. But it's, it's, you know, listen, it's nonsense. Know the Lord and walk with the Lord. Let's stand up. Abide in Him. And whatever your destiny is, whatever God has called you to, whatever gifts He's put in you, you'll fulfill them, but you'll have some say so. Listen, God, if God wanted robots, He would have just made them in the garden. How do you think Adam had the ability to fall? Because he had the right to choose. You have choices. And you can say, God, I don't want to do this. I want to do this. And you know what? It may not be exactly what God wants you to do, but He'll honor you the best that He can. He'll do the best that He can to help you in your choices. But some of it is just maybe you're praying for somebody and they're, maybe somebody's going to die and you're praying for them that they don't die. You know, and maybe, you know, maybe they've just opened the door for death by their words or whatever. And you go in there and you say, Father, I don't know, I don't care what the reasons are, but I'm praying for this person that, and I'm interceding that they will live and not die. Or there's some people, listen, there's some people I'll just, they'll, they'll get in my heart and I'll just, they, they, they don't need a healing, they need something more. And I'll start praying for the something more. And I love that about God. I remember a guy that came, he's actually standing right where, back where Keith is. And came in the church and I called him out. This was, this, this, I think we were here in this building, it was a couple years ago. But he'd come down from like Sacramento. Like he drove down that morning. It was like three in the morning. And he just made the decision to come down. At, God honored his face at three in the morning. God woke me up. <laughs> I don't like it number three, but I was okay. <laughs> what did you do? I just prayed. I prayed the whole time till the meeting started. And um, I called the guy out and I prayed for his neck. And his neck got healed. And he starts doing this and moving his neck all around. He's going, oh, I feel so good. I said, that's great, you know, hallelujah. <clears throat> you know, his neck was healed. That's great. He goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, I have two steel uh, bars in my neck so that I can't, he goes, my neck can't go past this. And he goes, like this. I guess the steel bars were gone. That's what you call a miracle. That's not a healing. That's a miracle. I've had three steel bar neck healings. And that's a, that's a sign and a wonder. So Herb, come on up here, Herb. Uh, Beverly, give me the tall, or, or Yonder, the tall microphone. This is where I believe we're going. I'm going to turn it on for you. See. I just don't think you're competent to do it yourself. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Maybe it's me. This time. Oh, there we go. Okay, come stand here, Herb, so people okay. see. Um, you, you had somebody that... Um, uh, contacted you. That's a right. friend of Bibi's, a, a prayer warrior. That's right. Uh, yeah. Just share share what she shared with you. Yeah. Uh, and she was was out of the blue. It wasn't like she was thinking about it or anything like that. Right. We were praying um, as we were always doing, and this was just Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And then a word came to her about Bob Cather's and the, the gathering place. <laughs> so that she saw like a spiritual explosion, an like spiritual explosion. And people will hear about it and will pour, just pour into this church. That is gonna happen soon. And that I think, what you had mentioned like the glory, that yes. like limbs will come, grow out and just healings and just unbelievable things that we haven't seen is going to manifest. She is very much aware of this church, how that we are constantly praying in tongues yeah. and fasting and seeking the Lord. And God sees that and is honoring that. And she saw this. She kept saying explosion, explosion. Wow, what is that? And she started to explain it more, that it was just... People are going to see it 
hear about it from all over and just come pouring into this church. The, she mentioned windows, but oh, there's only a couple. <laughs> but they're going to be coming through the windows. They're going to come through the doors. They have to get in. They're just going to flood. The area is just going to flood with people. Yeah. That's the miraculous. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... Uh, you're right. I mean, That's what, happened when the, that's what happens when the glory of the Lord falls. That you have not just healings. Listen, I believe that you take care of your body the best you possibly can do. That you're, you're a steward of your body. You know, when you see the Oreos, leave them there. You are the, you are the steward of your body. Nobody else can steward your body. You have to take the best possible care that you can of your body. But <clears throat> those kinds of things are beyond what you can do. And I, I think of Monty Perlin. He's a great stuntman. I don't know if he's still working in the business, but you, you know him. Uh, <clears throat> he shattered his leg in a motorcycle stunt. And he came to the church and he had, you know, crutches and he had this whole leg brace. It wasn't a broken leg, it was a shattered leg. And um, I don't remember exactly what happened if I called him up or whatever. Sometimes I see people come in like that, I just be like, Candy, like, I gotta pray for you, you know. <clears throat> but there was so much glory in that church because there were so many people praying. And and we were in there praying every we were praying six days a week in there for several hours. There was so much prayer and there was the glory of the Lord was there. And I remember he came up and I laid hands on him. He threw his crutches down, he pulled off his brace and he ran around the church. He never had another issue with his leg. That's a divine healing. That's the kind of things that the glory of the Lord brings. When we're talking today about abiding in Him, and then you go back to the Thursday message, Matthew 12. Matthew 12 is exactly how the glory of the Lord manifests. It's what Jesus taught us exactly what to do. That's what we're doing. That's what we're expecting. So with that, Rodney, would you play something? And I want you to just lift your hands to the Lord and I want you to just to step into his presence, just you and him. Just step into his presence. You can pray, you can sing, but I want you to just recognize. Just see him, see him on his throne. He doesn't look old. He looks young. He doesn't have white hair. That's the light. That's the glory that's around him. When he looks at you, it's with eyes of pure love. They cleanse you. They cleanse all unrighteous. They just take it right out of you. They take darkness right out of you. His eyes put life in you. And when He looks at you, they're eyes of pure love. The seraphim are flowing around the throne. It's so bright because of the glory that surrounds Him. Yet in the brightness is every color that you can imagine. And this is the knowledge that He wants you to have. That He created you for this main reason. So that He would have someone to love. Someone on His level that He could love. That's why you were created. And He wants to live in you. He wants you to live in Him. Knowing how difficult it would be in this world. He gave you a part of Himself to be with you. He gave you the Holy Spirit who's with you all the time, 24-7. Never leaves you. He's with you in your sleep. He also put His nature in you. Through His Word. He gave you his DNA, the lost DNA. What Adam lost, 
He replaced it in you. Go ahead, Rodney, sing. Rodney was, while Rodney was singing that, I could just feel the healing anointing. It was like coming into my forearm. It was like something, my forearm and my elbow, like there was a connection somehow where my forearm, my elbow, and not mine, but somebody, you're having an issue with your forearm and your elbow. God's touching it right now. And I'm not sure if this is the same person, but in um, not quite the low back, but kind of the mid back going into the low. There's like a weakness in there. It's like a weakness, a frailty, almost a fear. But that's there because of that. If you're feeling any of those things, just lift your hands up right now because there's a healing anointing. I don't even need to lay hands on you, but it's happening right now. I can feel it. It's even funny. It's almost like I feel... I'm not sure if it's the same person, but like I can feel my lower back, like really low, actually below the lower back, kind of almost like at the, the, the bone, the pelvis bone and the hips. It's almost like I feel a stiffness in there. And that stiffness is just being released right now. It's being healed right now. If that's you, just lift your hands right where you're at and just receive from the Lord. Now, as I feel, you know what? My forearm, my elbow feel better now. Who is that? Is that you? That's so good. Father, I just thank you for your healing mercy right now. I break the power of every infirmity in every person in this room. I pray for ears to be open. I pray for knees to be touched. I pray for restoration, things that have been lost in our body. I pray for them to be restored. Like Joshua and Caleb, like Moses, Abraham and Sarah. I pray for restoration right now within our bodies. I feel just, man, I just felt a surge in my lungs right now. If you've had issues with your lungs or your breathing, I just feel the anointing right now. Just take it in, just breathe it in. I mean, I felt like a surge, like like this air was forced in my lungs. And they just opened up. Who is that? Who, who is that? Had that surge in their lungs. Not you? <laughs> You're getting everything. I feel like, you know, I, I talked about this. I feel like there was a couple people with a hip thing. It was like it was like the back and the hip. But there's a woman in here. You've been having like it just been real uncomfortable for you. It's not like you're saying, Bob, it's not like I had an axe or anything. I just feel real uncomfortable. Like in, in this part of my back and my hips. It's just like when I twist my hips, just feel uncomfortable. I can feel the anointing right now. I can feel it in my body. It's moving. If that's you, just lift your hands up. I know I just said anybody, but just lift your hands up. Belinda, the moment I saw your hands go up, I felt the anointing start to come on you. I want you to just come up here real quick. That's a pretty good pace, Belinda. How is it? Is there still pain in there right now? 
There it is. Okay, come a little bit closer. Veronica, put your hand right on her. Right on her. Uh, I'm going sh- to show you. Right here. And Yolanda, is that right? Yep. Okay. Right there. Same, same, same area. Because that's where I felt it. Well, I wasn't expecting that, Beverly, but I'm glad it made you laugh. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! How are you doing? <laughs> That's a holy laugh to feel better, doesn't it? So much better. It's like been a nagging pain and you're just going, my God, am I going to have to have surgery? Am I going to have to do something like that? But now you know you're not. Like, as a matter of fact, do you feel anything? Just a little Yeah. But you feel the glory in there. Isn't God good? Everybody lift your hands up. I don't know. The moment you put your hands up, I just saw faith. And I knew that God was going to just touch you right there. He saw, come here, Sandra. I just felt Sandra like the enemy was trying to steal something like he was trying to steal health from you not just there in your hip but I felt like he was trying to steal health from you he was trying to like just to say oh you know you have a certain age and you got to have these things no you don't no you don't so I release that to you say Bob why are you yelling at people I'm not it's just sometimes when I lay hands on somebody that authority comes out what happens when you pray too much in tongues? Tell you a quick story before we pray for Kristen. I've had probably four different people say this to me in the last month. We were talking about it actually yesterday in the prayer meeting. Because a pastor down in San Diego, he said to me, he goes, I- I've preached there several times and I preached there last Sunday and he said, Bob, you look like you've got taller. I said, I have. I'm not as tall as I used to be, but I'm getting taller. I go, God's restoring my height. You know that you know that Jerry Lewis was six foot four? But when he died, he was five foot nine. That's how much his body deteriorated. So it can happen. Your body can just start to, to as you get older, it can shrink down. And you know, you're doing heavy, heavy lifting, sometimes you you create problems for yourself but the Holy Spirit said has been telling me I want to bring restoration for this coming generation and I believe Bob Jones word that somewhere around 2030 the church is going to start overcoming death but somebody has to be the mentors for those who are overcoming death I believe I'm going to be one of them and many of you and as the glory of the Lord hits that's something that listen we are going to see unusual miracles and I've seen I've seen so many unusual miracles when I prayed for people over the years but we're going to see things that I've never seen and one of the things we're going to see is people being restored and there are going to be some women that They're older, but they've never had a child, but they wanted to have a child. God's going to restore the wombs. That's going to be one of the miracles. He's going to restore the wombs. And and literally the ability to have children like he did with Sarah. That's going to be one of the signs. Because the enemy has been stealing the children of young women through murdering them. God's going to begin to give them to women that have wanted them but never had them. And even some women that have had abortions before they knew God, 
some of them he's going to restore their wombs and they're going to be able to have children. I know you're saying, Bob, you're out of your mind. I've been out of my mind for a long time. So that's, you know, I'm just telling you, I'm prophesying things that I have seen that are coming. And when this woman told Herb about what's going on about three months ago, I had one of the most, it was a vision of the night and I was in, in, in a severe battle. Like I, with, this, with a man, I was in a severe battle. Like I was gouging out his eyes. You have to understand, I grew up in Silmar. It was kind of a rough area. And we fought really dirty. And I was in a battle, and, and I'm like gouging this guy's eyes out. And it's, it's like it was a scratch and fight battle. But I knew it was a spiritual battle. And this is, I was here while I was sleeping. And then I was taken to this huge terrarium on the Lord. It was like the Lord said, you're going to have to pray like you've never prayed before for what's coming. In other words, you have a battle that you've never had before. And we're in that now. That's funny, Stuart, I almost forgot. Last week, I had a dream about Stuart, about his left eye. And I, I mentioned it openly. And afterwards, we were talking in the back room, and he goes, well, yeah, I was, went to the optometrist, and there was something wrong with my left eye. About a year ago or so. Three or four years ago. It was strange I had a dream about it. And I, you know, I was just like, because I wasn't thinking about Stuart. Not that I don't love you and think about you, brother, but I wasn't. I didn't go to bed thinking, I wonder what Stuart's doing right now. <laughs> I was thinking more like, I wonder what I'm going to eat when I get up. No. Come on up here, Stuart. Come on, Kristen. Everybody stretch your hands out toward this young lady. You face me, sweetheart. I couldn't get out. Couldn't get out. I okay. Yeah. Everybody stretch your hand out. And say this with me. We stand atop of the word of the Lord. Spoken so many years ago. By Prophet Kim Clement. About divine healing. And health. We stand upon the covenant promise of 1 Peter 2.24. We thank you, Jesus. You bore our sins in your own body on the cross. That we, being dead to sin, should live under righteousness. And I declare over Kristen, she will run around with other children. I declare, I declare by the stripes of Jesus, Jesus. You, are you are healed. I command, I command. Your, brain your brain to fully function yes. the way that God created it to. Your, created it to. your nervous system, your nervous system. To, fully to fully function the way that God created it to. Your, your muscular system, your muscular system. to fully function the way that God created it to you. All of your internal organs to function the way that God created them to. And I speak healing and life over your body. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Stuart. Just stretch your hand out towards Stuart. Stuart, I don't know, but I had the dream, and it was three years ago that you had the issue. He said something with your yeah, left eye. Yeah. So we're just going to cure it. Or just, I say, we're, the Lord's going to cure it. You don't pray, Stuart. We're going to pray for you. There, I just felt the anointing released into your eye. 
Now, what I'm going to say this, I'm gonna, I know I've got to dismiss you because we've gone long, but what I'm going to say, I want to say for everybody. I was actually listening to uh, an old Kenneth Hagin teaching. He was really my mentor when it came to healing. And according to him, most of us here know nothing about healing. <laughs> now, he really understood healing, like on a different level. But one of the things he said, he goes, once you've been healed, or once you re- receive healing, don't let it go. Some people go, well, I didn't feel anything at the moment. Yeah, but don't let it go. Or if you're healed and you feel it, but a symptom comes back and you go, oh, no, I got a symptom. No, say, get out of there. In other words, once you've trusted God for healing, don't ever let it go. Once you believe for something, don't let it go. Stand on it. Stand on the truth of the Bible. Stand on the truth of the scriptures. And for Kristen, one of the things we did right now I was just impressed by the Holy Spirit to call upon that word that God gave to her all those years ago, 1993 or April, Kim Clement prophesied over her. And we just called on that word as that we brought it to remembrance. So, because I like to operate by word of knowledge, but you can pray any way you want if God leads you. All right. If anybody else says, I'd like somebody to agree with me in prayer, or just say, I'm a head case, I need help. (laughs) We have a prayer team up here. I'm keen about the head case thing. But if you say, I want somebody to agree with me in prayer, these guys are up here. We're going to dismiss. I want you to know, um, Rodney's going to just lead us in a prayer to dismiss us. So if you would do that, Rodney. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Really, it's grace over this audience, this congregation. Lord, we release grace over the those watching on the internet. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Nothing missing and nothing broken. Now go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Go in His grace. 